Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's rather strange because I can see the three speakers and there's hundreds of you who I can't see. Um, but um, I trust in technology that you're all there. Um, we've got more than 100 with more to join, so that's jolly exciting. Thank you very much for your interest. Um, welcome to our webinar entitled Moving to and Investing in Portugal, a safe haven in the post C19 era webinar. Our speakers, who I will briefly introduce in a moment, are the principals of three leading Lisbon firms. And as you're aware, they will focus on key property, tax and legal issues. In terms of the webinar structure, and in order to try to keep to our one hour allocated time, um, we have prepared a balanced selection of 10 questions around what we deem to be key current themes, which we hope you will be interested and motivated by and wishing to be educated in. Um, in addition to our 10 speaker questions, there will also be approximately 50 minutes available for six questions from the audience, two for each speaker. I know it all sounds rather mathematical, but uh, that's, that's necessary, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of audience question logistics, if you'd like to ask a question, please detail your question in the chat section of the, on the screen by no later than 5.30. Um, please provide your name and state to whom you would like your question responded by. Um, any questions which are not managed during the webinar will be responded to by email personally by one of the three speakers after the event. Um, as a side note, we would also like to please ask for your collaboration in completing a three-question poll, which will magically materialize courtesy of our marketing ladies during the event. Thank you. Right, and now to introduce our speakers, our three wise men. Whom you, may, whom you can see clearly, I hope, on the screen. We have a Londoner, a Yorkshireman, and an Irishman, which together with myself have more than 100 years of experience uh, of doing business in Portugal. And in no particular order, but don't take it personally, Matthew, want to wave, Matthew, there he is. Matthew Chrisman, Matthew was born in London. He has lived in Lisbon uh, since 2003. And he advises members of the international community in the areas of tax, investments, and pensions. He studied biology at university and is fluent in both Portuguese and Spanish. That's an rarity for a Brit, having previously lived in Madrid. Matt is a keen golfer and a member of Estoril Golf Club. He informs me he took up playing the guitar during lockdown, as his poor neighbours in Lisbon will no doubt testify. Now over to Charles. Charles is the Yorkshireman, our Yorkshireman, proudly born on Oakley Moor, probably the capital of Yorkshire. Uh, Charles is a 65 year old, of which 35 years have been spent in Portugal. Charles is a marketing sales veteran of the Portuguese high end real estate market. He lives in Cascais and is married to a Brazilian wife with one daughter, Sara, who is an old school friend of my daughter, Katie. Um, Charles and myself actually also share a birthday, although not being quite of the same vintage. <laughs> Charles is a, United, is a Leeds United supporter and is desperately hoping to return to the English Premier League this year after 14 years of lockout. Vamos ver, we will see. And to Geoffrey, last but by no means least, after studying law in, in England, Geoffrey went back to his hometown, his roots in Belfast, and then uh, has followed his career into London and then to Lisbon, where he has now lived and worked for more than 20 years. Geoffrey is honorary legal advisor to the British Ambassador since 2012 and is also the recommended legal advisor by the Irish Embassy. He is a fan of most sports, particularly when Ireland play rugby, we won't dwell upon that, and Liverpool, the other sport with the round ball. Geoffrey is a wine enthusiast, as most of us are. But he favours the Dow region in particular, and uh, to complement his wine, wine drinking, he has a mission <laughs> to become an adept surfer and keep up with his 10-year-old son. Voila. Uh, in terms of myself, I'm really not going to introduce myself, but if you want to find out who on earth I am, uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. I've been in Portugal for many, many, many years working in the resort and residential development sphere, and, uh, and I've had 30 great years in Portugal, and I tend to have a few more, perhaps not 30. Right, that concludes the event and speaker introductions. 
So it's now time, as they say, for question time. Right. Here we go. The questions one, two, and three uh, are focused on uh, the dreaded C19, which we hope we are beginning to move away from and out of. And the first two questions are for Jeffrey and Matthew. Both of you, what is your view of the way that Portugal has handled the C19 crisis? And do you really consider Portugal to be a safe haven? Okay, I'm going to start on that one. Andrew, thank you very much for the introduction and um, pleasure to be here with my co-panelists and with, with you. Um, I think the answer to the question is, is yes. That's a short um, uh, reply, but um, I think in answering it in a, a little bit more verbose form, I'd have to use two words. Um, one is uh, responsibility and the other is, is continuity. I think uh, responsibility because the reaction of the Portuguese government um, to the COVID-19 uh, crisis was a responsible one, which was very early on driven by a consensus between the president and the prime minister. So whilst from two opposing political parties, they realized that a health issue of this dimension actually didn't really have a political color, um, and therefore consensus was important. Reading from the same hymn sheet was important. As a result, the state of emergency was implemented pretty early on the 18th of March, after only 642 cases, um, and actually only two deaths. Now, every death, of course, is a tragedy, but I think in, in comparison to a number of other countries, and I think that Portugal was very much looking at its southern European neighbour, in particular um, Italy, um, they were very keen to implement a lockdown as early as possible because they saw that only in this way could they contain the virus and also could they actually allow the health system, if you like, to cope with the virus. So um, I actually read in one of the main Portuguese newspapers about two or three days ago that if Portugal had only implemented this lockdown two weeks later, they would have had three times the number of ICU cases, which really would have put extreme pressure on both uh, the public and the private health system. Um, and that has followed through in terms of number of cases. So I think that as a result, Portugal has been able to come out of confinement, maybe a little bit faster than other countries. Um, and therefore there was a very phased approach which was implemented to um, declarations of state of emergency and now a state of adversity, whereby um, there has been um, deconfinement, as they call it, um, has increased. So where we are now is uh, from um, yesterday, we have a, a, a situation whereby shopping centres, other than shopping centres in Lisbon, um, are allowed, um, larger shopping centres are allowed to open, um, creches are, are open, cinemas are open, um, and um, I actually even had a, a very agreeable experience at the weekend of going out for my first dinner with my family um, for, well, it seems like last year, since last year, but um, so, but I have to say that the staff there, again, very responsibly responding. Um, so they were all face masks. Um, we had to be face masked when we entered the restaurant and when we left. So um, from a perspective of, of working um, environment as well, we've only just recently implemented a a sort of rotational return to work um, and whilst now remote working is not obligatory um, there are a number of firms which are still actually implementing that um, at least on a partial basis. So as of today um, there are nearly 12,000 um, cases of COVID. Um, there are over 20,000 who have recovered from COVID and there are um, just over 1400 deaths. So, as I say, whilst every death is a tragedy, I think that Portugal has actually acted responsibly with it. And here's where I go to my second word, which I hadn't forgotten about, which <laughs> is continuity. Um, and continuity because there were support, there was a, a number of measures of support which were announced and put into place for businesses. Um, loans uh, at very favorable terms were offered two businesses. Um, there was a simplified layoff regime in order to uh, 
ensure continuity, particularly um, of SMEs. Um, and therefore, there was always uh, one eye, I suppose, upon the fact that whilst these lockdown measures may be quite extreme right now, we are looking at post-lockdown and we are looking at post-COVID-19 and we're look looking at a situation of recovery, which we all hope is going to be in the shape and form of a V-shaped um, recovery, indeed, as um, the uh, Minister for the Economy um, was reported as certainly hoping for and aiming towards in, in Bloomberg. So I suppose Portugal has been recognised um, across the board, Guardian, New York Times, um, Dear Spiegel, number of publications as a country which has handled um, the COVID-19 crisis very responsibly. Um, and as a result, therefore, we see, and certainly we hope to see, um, an element of continuity moving forward. Very good, Geoffrey. Great right overview. Thank you very, very much. Over good. to Matthew. Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, appreciate being invited here today and uh, nice to share the podium with my esteemed colleagues. Um, I echo Jeffrey's comments there. Um, I'm not going to give any more facts that, that, um, to, to, to this, um, but really for someone who's lived here in Portugal, and I live in central Lisbon, um, somebody who's lived here for 17 years, um, we had a coherent message at the beginning from both um, the Prime Minister and the President, um, and that was reflected um, in the way people reacted. Um, on the 18th of March, when we went into lockdown, we literally saw uh, the streets were deserted um, and people very much from day one adhered to this. Um, and I think also we had the fact that the opposition party aligned completely with this. Um, nobody used this at all as a political uh, tool to attack the other party. They were fully aligned to both the president and the prime minister's message, um, both entering lockdown um, and exiting um, the state of um, emergency, which we're um, going through the process at the moment. Um, this has obviously been reflected in low infection rates and death rates in per capita compared to many other countries. Um, in terms of um, life returning to normal, we are seeing this now um, slowly. Um, office hours are being staggered ourselves at Bleving Strengths. We're, we're staggering our office hours ourselves and, and making the right hygienic practices to be allowed into the office. Uh, but Portugal was already um, really with the international press um, deemed to be very much um, safe and, and to be invested in. We had a, a, a newspaper article last year calling, calling Portugal um, Europe's beacon of social democracy um, when Antonio Costa's government came in for another four year term. Um, and really I think um, very much reinforced by the way um, I think all of us who live here have felt that the message has been coherent, it's been clear, um, the steps have been um, very much um, planned. So it's nice to see. Um, see. Thank you. Very good, Matthew. Politics is always always welcome, particularly during these uh, terrible times. All right, and now a question for, for Charles. Charles, will your company substantively change its working methods as a result of C19? And assuming so, uh, in, in what way? Um, <clears throat> okay, thank you, Andrew, and, and welcome to all of you that have dialed in to this webinar. Uh, before I answer the question, just to add on to what Jeffrey and um, Matthew were saying, uh, I also uh, last weekend went out to a restaurant for the very first time in Qashqais, which seemed like forever. And it was a very different experience. No tables were allowed to be laid before you arrived. The waiters had all been tested and trained before being allowed to open the restaurant. No linen tablecloths, only paper. Knives and forks delivered in the same way as they are in an airplane in a sealed package. No linen uh, napkins, had to be paper. It was a strange experience, but it was very pleasurable to get out and about again. And further to add to um, Geoffrey and Matthew's comments, uh, where I live in the uh, municipality of Kashkais, uh, the municipality is giving free of charge a test to every single resident in the municipality, the, the Roche test to see whether you've had COVID or not. 
and the mayor has also set up a factory in Qashqais to manufacture uh, face masks for the population. So I think in many ways um, we have so far done well and set a good example. Um, <clears throat> going back to your question about whether we'll substantively change our working methods, I mean there's, a, there's an obvious answer to that question which applies to the medium term and, and is common to all businesses in that we are complying with all the hygiene and social distancing regulations that are in place and we will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. This does of course present challenges in our business in visiting properties for sale with potential clients, challenges in arranging meetings with banks, lawyers, notaries, uh, but with ingenuity we're able to overcome these. Uh, this webinar is, is perhaps actually an example of what's changed. The concept of a webinar is not new, uh, but only now, due to force of circumstance, the concept has really come into its own. Uh, I rather wish that I'd bought shares in Zoom uh, in <laughs> December of last year. Uh, we've all discovered that there are many things that can be dealt with online rather than face-to-face -face meetings, and I'm certain that this type of communication will remain and continue to grow post-COVID as there are, there are actually implicit costs, cost savings. Uh, and what previously may have seemed strange, awkward, or uncomfortable is now the new normal. You know? No need to get in the car and drive 20 kilometers to go and see Jeffrey in his office, for example, uh, when, and worry about parking the car, paying, etc. when we can actually have this meeting through this type of technology. However, there is one central factor that in our business cannot change. You can produce as many virtual tours of a property as you like and send them to potential clients. But at the end of the day, the client will only buy with an in-person visit to the property. Nobody is going to make this type of purchase based on a video that may have accidentally forgotten to show the mobile telephone mast just outside the garden, the noisy primary school next door, or the damp patches in the basement. Yes, virtual tours have a use in that they are very helpful for clients to narrow down their options before coming to Portugal to visit their short list of potential properties. But as I say, virtual tours and the like are a tool to aid and not a replacement for in-person visits to properties. So our, our business is very much dependent on being able to freely visit a property uh, with mum, dad and two kids, maybe with the owner being there. And those are challenges that we are having to face right now. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Charles. Good to learn of positives coming out of this horrible C19 situation. We're going to now move our focus of attention onto the non-habitual tax regime and the golden visa programs, which have been important to Portugal uh, in the recovery time after the financial crisis. Um, and the, the double act of Jeffrey and Matthew are going to, uh, going to share a question. Um, gentlemen, there were a number of changes to the NHR program in the Portuguese budget which came into force this April, uh, as well as a framework for a view of the Golden Visa program. How have these programs fared during the crisis? And what do you think their prospects are for the future? Thank you. Okay, um, so Andrew, um, first of all, non-habitual residence, the NHR program, has been around in Portugal since 2009. So we've had it for 11 years already, and it's been a huge success. Um, it was introduced, if we remember, going back at the height of the global financial crisis um, when Portugal was going through a period of tough austerity and really it, it did mark a turnaround in the economy here. Um, both pensioners and, and, and those with what they deemed high value added activities um, came to Portugal um, and I would say in, in our Lisbon, Kishkaish region we're probably the biggest benefactors of that. Um, in terms of non-habitual residency, the, the benefits of that, this NHR tax regime, well, 
pensions to start with were taxed at zero percent they were exempt with progression in portugal but overseas pensions that's changed with the budget this year on the 1st of april this year any new nhr applicants on the 1st of april this year um, will have their pensions taxed now at 10 percent if they, they come from overseas um, dividends and, and investment income is still tax exempt in portugal arising from overseas and those people with their work activity that's deemed high of value um, added activity um, has a flat income tax rate for Portuguese source income of 20 percent um, which is a lot of the scale rates here um, for, for most of the scale rates um, there have changed in the budget this year as well um, the list of high value added activities um, to bear that in mind but in terms of the golden visa, which is more a residency program the golden visa started in 2012 um, and there were plans during the, this recent budget to actually change and um, include Lisbon, Porto um, and the coastal region to encourage investments in the rest of Portugal. Um, but those plans, because of the coronavirus, have been shelved. Um, but really, um, both programs have fared well during the crisis. Um, really, people's confidence seems to remain undiminished. At Levin's ranks, dura during the whole coronavirus, we continue to receive a high level of inquiries online for people looking to move here um, once travel restrictions are lifted. Um, in terms of the prospects for these programs, well, I would say they're undoubtedly bright. Um, the fact that Portugal um, taxes pensions at 10% now is still a lot lower and an attractive proposition compared to other EU destinations. Um, and uh, it shows the government's desire to continue with these programs and, and one really last point is that we have to be aware that across the political spectrum portugal has has very much endorsed this program because nhr started during a right-wing government in portugal um, and uh, we moved to a more liberal government um, under Passos Coelho. they kept these programs going and brought in um, the, the, the golden visa and we're now under a social democratic more left-leaning government and this government under Antonio Costa has once again endorsed them, realized that this is very good for inward investment and kept them going with, with these minor changes. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Matthew. Over to Jeffrey. Oh, you're muted, Jeffrey. We can't hear you. Come back to us. We can't hear you. Yes, uh, my my sound was deactivated um, by a third party, should we say? Oh, uh, perhaps Russian. not liking what Russian. perhaps not, not liking what I was about to say. Um, but I promise you, it won't be controversial, um, or I hope not. Anyway, um, I think uh, just really to complement what uh, what Matthew has said. Um, one has to really look at the background to the changes which were made, for example. Um, to the non-habitual uh, non residency program. Um, there, there was a lot of pressure coming from both externally, um, individual European countries, and internally um, to some of the more left-leaning parties within the confidence and supply arrangement, uh, which the, the, the biggest party, PS, uh, currently um, in power. Um, and it was in the context of this pressure, I think, that the changes were made. I mean, uh, there was an awful lot of press um, uh, both at the end of last year and the beginning of, um, of this year, whereby both the Prime Minister and also the Minister of the Economy indicated that they wished to keep the non habitual residency programme as it was. However, I think in their wisdom they also realised that pension was really the category of income which was coming under the most pressure, and therefore some form of change had to be made. And that change, as Matthew said, is in the form of a 10% of a flat rate for new NHRs, um, which is not bad, really, um, when one looks at some of the tax rates across Europe and beyond uh, for high earners. Um, there's also another aspect to this, which is it did open up different categories of income to this 10% band, pre-retirement income, for example. So 
actually rather than, and I'm going to come back to this word again, continuity, um, rather than actually seeing it as something nefarious or something to be concerned about, I actually think it is something which um, we can get confidence in uh, from is the fact that this government is committed to the longevity of the program, the continuity of the program, um, and with 40,000 odd, more or less, um, NHRs in Portugal, um, it's, I think it is committed to actually working the program moving forward, and all the more so, I think, in the situation where, um, you know, looking back, as, as Matthew has mentioned, to the crisis in 2008, we are facing another crisis, and I think um, the Portuguese government is aware of the fact that one of the ways in order to exit a crisis is in order to attract foreign investment. So the same would go for the Golden Visa Programme. Um, there is a lot of pressure um, whilst there is a framework put into place for potential changes to that programme. Um, there's a lot of pressure just to keep things as they are, um, which we believe would be the, uh, the sensible option. And obviously it's an option which um, is open to third country nationals in Portugal um, and open to British citizens. And some, that's something which I will come back to um, certainly from the 1st of January of 2021. Good. Uh, guys, are you going to cover inheritance tax and in, any future um, responses to questions? I think an inheritance tax is really, it's fairly straightforward, um, the treatment of inheritance tax in Portugal. Um, nothing changed with the actual uh, um, the budget itself. Um, and um, therefore, it's a territorial tax, and therefore only applied to assets within Portugal. And secondly, for close families, so for spouse, all ascendants and descendants, the inheritance tax is 0%. So it's actually one of the other attractive features which Portugal has in terms of, a, a, from a tax perspective. Um, and that, as I said, has not changed. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, back over to property, to real estate, and to, to Charles. Uh, this question uh, looks at uh, buyers and buyer motives. Charles, uh, what are the main demand drivers, as we consultants call them, or, or key motives for the foreign market buying real estate in the geographies which find and country cover? And do you see these conceivably changing uh, in the recovery post? nineteen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, firstly, I think I should just make clear the geographies in Portugal that our license of foreign and country actually covers. We have four main offices, one covering basically central and historic Lisbon, one covering Estoril, Cascais and Sintra, one covering Porto and the north of the country, and one covering the Comporta area, which is one hour's drive south of Lisbon on what is known as the Blue Coast. Now. Um, your question refers to demand drivers, and I, I've thought about that a little bit. And, and basically, I feel that there are four different motives uh, for buying a property, a foreign buying a property in Portugal. Uh, but in some cases, these motives may actually have a crossover. Number one would be a client looking to invest in a holiday property uh, to use for a few weeks of the year between family and friends, and is most likely looking to find a property management company that can arrange holiday rentals for that apartment for the remainder of the year. That property management company using the services of the likes of Airbnb, Home, and away, home away, Booking.com, and all the work associated with that being done by the property management company. So the owner is just receiving an income. He doesn't actually have to do anything. You know? um, and basically, this type of buyer is looking for an income that will help to cover the fixed costs associated with the ownership of the apartment or the villa or whatever it is. Number two would be a client looking to invest in a second home in Portugal with no interest in generating an income from the asset. 
Number three would be a client looking to invest in a primary home residence in Portugal. Again, no interest in uh, generating an income from the asset. And finally, number four would be an investor, individual or corporate, looking for a property that will generate sufficient income or, and yield, as well as capital growth. And this client will never use the property himself. This is just an investment vehicle. Yeah? Add to this the two schemes that have just been talked about, the Portuguese, um, but the government, Portuguese government have promoted. Uh, the Golden Visa Scheme, which, as they say, basically gives non-EU residents, Portuguese residents, in five years, possibility of a Portuguese passport in the sixth year, most commonly through the purchase of a property at above 500,000 euros. The other scheme being the non-habitual tax residency program, much better explained by Matthew uh, or Jeffrey, but in, in essence offers very favorable taxation rates on pension and investment income, and is proving highly popular from, from residents of high tax countries, as, as Jeffrey said. And the applicant is required to spend six months of the year in Portugal in order to qualify. Uh, where do these clients come from? Principally, Brazil, France, UK, Ireland, Scandinavia, South Africa, Hong Kong, and the Middle East. Yeah? Other countries also, but those would be the main places. Do we see any of these key motives changing? The short answer, I think, has to be no, but the, the, if you take the whole cake, maybe the percentage division of the cake between those four types of buyers, the proportions of that may change. Yeah? Um, but in, you know, I firmly believe that the attractions of Portugal, uh, whether they be lifestyle, weather or fiscal, are the same pre-COVID and will remain so post-COVID. And the areas of Portugal uh, that we cover have seen in the last 10 years a, a, a surge in demand, uh, particularly in Lisbon, especially in the historic center, which is all now protected and is being restored to its former glory. Lisbon, Cascais and Estoril are attracting literally thousands of foreigners who wish to live here permanently. And I want to give you an example of why I think that will continue, but not from a typical yardstick that you might use. I think it's evidenced by the large growth in the number of international schools in the greater Lisbon area. Those people, institutions, companies investing in the building and operation of an international school are not looking to the short term. They're basing their investment decision on in-depth market research of where they foresee wealthy people with kids that they can afford the school fees are going to reside. And I find that a very, very positive thing for our market in this area. Okay. Back to you, Andrew. Super. Thank you, Charles. We're going to move to questions seven and eight, um, which have a, you may remember it, Brexit theme. Well, we probably would like to forget Brexit, um, but alas, we can't. Um, so for the double act, Jeffrey and Matthew, uh, Brexit has been overshadowed, of course, by the C-19 crisis. But the end of the transition period, as we know, is still scheduled for the end of this year, with arguably limited prospects for extension. How will Brexit affect British investors from the 1st of January 2021? How the sh and how should they be planning for it? Over to you, Jeffrey. Okay. You heard these there. So, uh, look, I think that I think first thing to um, emphasize um, is what the position is pre Brexit. Uh, well, we already have had Brexit, of course. We are currently in a transition period. So um, pre the end of the transition period, it is possible for British citizens to establish residency um, in Portugal and for that establishment of residency to be protected post-Brexit. 
So up to the 31st of December, that will be the case. And that is something which has been assured by the Portuguese government um, in legislation and certainly the noises which are coming out from or emanating from the, um, the immigration authorities, um, CEF. So what's also very encouraging for British citizens is the fact that um, for British citizens who have established those residency rights, <coughs> they will be granted a five-year residency post-Brexit. Therefore, no need for renewals. There's a five-year residency um, visa which is granted, or residency title which is granted um, to British citizens. Now, um, that doesn't mean that, let's say, you're a British citizen who's resided in Portugal for two years prior to the end of the transition period, um, and you're granted your five-year residency card you can still apply for permanent residency after five years. Um, so once again, encouraging news. Um, the devil, of course, in these things is detail and how exactly British citizens are going to be able to exchange um, their EU residency certificates um, with a um, third country national residency card um, is still being implemented as I understand but it is something which the immigration authorities are aware of um, and needs to be addressed. Um, Post-Brexit, or post-end of transition, I should say, um, then it opens up the door to the Golden Visa. Now, as Charles said, um, one of the requirements to fulfill for successfully applying for the Golden Visa is an investment in real estate of 500,000 euros. Um, and uh, there are also uh, some smaller ceilings, for example, rehabilitation property, one ceiling of which is for 350,000. Um, but it is very much a very, very successful program, which has worked extremely well for third country nationals um, up to now. And um, there is a question mark, in fact, over whether British citizens can already apply for the Golden Visa, but that is something which is still unclear, I have to say. But um, equally, um, this is an option which will certainly be available um, after the 31st of December of this year, on the presumption, of course, that there isn't an extension um, to the transition period. Um, so I think the message overall is that um, for British citizens who are currently resident in, in Portugal, really nothing to worry about because your residency rights are, are protected. Um, for those British citizens who are considering becoming resident in Portugal moving forward after the end of a transition period, there will be mechanisms available to you which will enable you fairly easily to be able to take advantage of a, of a residency title which after five years in the case of um, Golden Visa will enable you to acquire an EU nationality or citizenship. Matthew, and over to, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um... Let's start really with um, my answer, looking, looking back. British people have been settling in Portugal for centuries. They, they, they came centuries ago, well before either country joined what was then known as the common market. Um, they set up businesses in, in the likes of port wine trade, mining, cork, shipping, the list goes on. And many of those companies are still here today. Okay? Um, it's mentioned a lot, but Portugal and the UK have the world's oldest political alliance, and this really does mean something. So, um, yes, Brexit is happening, or what, as Jeffrey mentioned, it has happened. We're in a tr transition period at the moment. What is clear um, that if you obtain your residency, your residency here before the transition period ends, then of course you have your acquired rights and right to remain. So, obviously, from a bureaucratic point of view, it's better. To, if you're looking to move here with as a British passport holder, um, if you're looking to move here over the short term, then from a bureaucratic point of view, it's better to move before the end of this year. Um, but then if you move here next year or after the transition period expires, um, as Jeffrey mentioned, the golden visa could be an avenue open to you or, or whatever the, the visa process will be. Um, so really, uh, from uh, a financial planning perspective, in terms of um, how people should be planning for it, as financial planners at Blevins Franks, please remember the clock for Brexit is still clicking, uh, it's ticking, should I say, in terms of the transition period. People should be using this time, if they're still in the UK, to use up their 
savings and tax allowances uh, before leaving. And please remember, all these tax years, despite the coronavirus, remain the same. Um, bear that in mind. And, and one thing I'd like to highlight is um, pensions for those people with the transition period expiring at some point. Um, for those with UK pensions denominated in sterling, Portugal being a Eurozone country, there is a currency risk there. And for those of you with uh, UK pensions moving to Portugal, um, you can take advantage of the um, myriad of, of, of um, uh, opportunities for overseas pension schemes, known, known as qualifying recognized overseas pension schemes. But um, there will be a possible overseas pension transfer charge um, when the extension period or transition period ends. Um, so if you are looking to do that, my advice is to act now when you, while you still have time. Um, but really, from a financial planning perspective, um, it is a great opportunity at the moment um, to really get your financial planning in order um, before the end of the transition period so that you can plan with certainty. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Geoffrey. Um, the last two questions are of a, of a property focus uh, and they're obviously targeted obviously at Charles. Um, question nine relates to pricing. Always a hot potato for Charles. Uh, according to a recent global residential report by, by Frank, it was stated that only Monaco, Shanghai, and Lisbon would see a substantial bounce back and price rises of 5% next year. Do you subscribe to this opinion? Um, in the short term, is it not likely that C19 may cause there to be a different form of price readjustment? Okay. Um, do I subscribe to the opinion about Lisbon? In general terms, yes, I do. Uh, especially relating to the zones of the historic centre of Lisbon and the apartments surrounding the central business district. I'm not referring this to the domestic market of high-rise apartments that are in the suburbs of Lisbon. We're, we're referring here to the areas that are attractive to foreign investors. Yeah. And one has to remember that Lisbon is not a big city, and one of its boundaries, and one might say one and a half of its boundaries, is a river to which it cannot expand. Yeah. Um, and as the historic centre and the central business district cannot physically, geographically expand, due to this, the laws of the market come into play. If you imagine Mayfair in London, it cannot grow. Yeah? It's, it's a defined postcode. And historic Lisbon is the same. Um, therefore, if demand exceeds supply, then prices rise. It's as simple as that. In the area of historic Lisbon, all renovation projects must retain or rebuild the original facade of the building when being uh, restored or converted into apartments. Planning approvals take time, and the actual building conversion takes a couple of years after planning is approved. Demand is such that almost all off-plan projects are sold out. So if you don't, if you don't want, or you cannot wait, you're going to have to pay a premium for a finished resale. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Do I think there'll be a price readjustment generally? If there is, I don't think it'll be by very much, and not for very long. This is not the same situation as in the financial banking crisis of 2008 to 2010, when supply massively exceeded demand, and Portuguese developers were hugely overgeared financially. In today's market, there is a, a more balanced equilibrium, and much of the development is now being done by international funds with very strong balance sheets, not so much by local developers. This makes a huge difference. Of course, you will get the odd situation where an owner has to sell his property because his business has failed, which creates an opportunity for a, a vulture purchaser. But these have always been around in one respect or another in the forms of divorce, death, etc. But they're the exceptions to the rule and not, not the rule itself. 
And and finally, I think one of the one of the most important things is that uh, Portugal generally and Greater Lisbon area have seen an exponential growth in popularity as a tourist destination and as an investment opportunity in real estate. And we must remember that Lisbon started from a very low base in 2013. 5,000 euros per square meter for a luxury apartment in historic Lisbon was considered expensive then. We are now at over 10,000 euros per square meter for that same apartment. And yet 10,000 euros per square meter is nowhere near the prices of London, Milan, Berlin, Madrid, Paris, Cannes, you name it. It's actually on a par with top quality city centre real estate in Bratislava. I therefore confidently conclude that there's lots of room for prices to increase on a managed basis. Back to you, Andrew. Good, Charles. Very uh, comforting. Very comforting, positive question. Our last question uh, at this stage for the speakers, or my, my questions to the speakers, uh, and our product focus, Charles. Uh, after C19, um, do you see, is it likely there will be a change from the market, the sort of products that the market will demand? Well, actually, you'll, you'll see from my reply that I'm almost going to be throwing this back to you, but um, uh, quite possibly. But in, in real estate, these things take time. In fact, they take years to be reflected in the product offer. Developers are naturally conservative and regard change as representing risk. No one would know this better than you, Andrew, as your company advises developers on real estate and leisure strategies, often starting with a blank sheet of paper. And you may well be looking at trends today that may only become a reality in a decade from now, and probably looking at concepts that we are not even aware of. To make these a reality, you often have to convince the developer of the need and the sense, and then even to convince local and national government of the advantages, and in some cases, this may require a change in national legislation to incorporate some of these things. So to conclude, I would say, yes, we should expect process and change, but this is always over the longer term. This is not a, a 100 meter sprint. Yeah? So things evolve. Uh, there is no revolution in this that's that's my opinion you may wish to expand on it yourself because you're better qualified than me <laughs> you're very kind charles um this is this is not a set up everybody in the audience but i just to respond very very briefly because i hadn't allocated time for myself to respond to any questions um i think it was interesting that yesterday i read some media um related to the alentejo region of portugal being now one of the world's top 20 uh, most sought after uh, destinations. Um, so in terms of space, in terms of nature, uh, authenticity, um, back to rolling farmlands and homesteads, um, I can see that. And I would say that, yes, we are working on a particular new concept for a, um, for a development. Um, and if everybody wants to tune on to the into the internet after of course our seminar then have a look at www.plantationechoretreats.com um, we consider that this really will represent the future uh, of, of projects and developments we're very much out of town very much in in portuguese rurality and in nature and here we must conclude the speaker's questions um, so i'd like to thank Matthew and Charles and Jeffrey. Um, it is now time for, the, for me to put the questions that the audience have tapped into our chat section. And I now need to just flip over to my laptop and see what we have here. I hope that our speakers have all 
received the email. Please nod. Are you are you brief speakers? I can't speak. Right. Jeffrey, have you got your questions? Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Oh well. Well, it's too late, chaps. It'll have to be spontaneous. <laughs> On the <roof. laughs> I'm happy with that. <laughs> Jolly good. Here we go. But Charles, Charles, yeah. Charles first. I just got a list here. I haven't time to read it, so we just have to go off the hoof, Andrew. That's good. That's good. That's good. This has been submitted by Mr. Thomas Meyer, and mm -hmm. Thomas asked Charles how he thinks C19 will affect the property as well as land plot prices in Portugal, and would it be wise to invest now, or do you think that market pricing, he says, will continue to go down? Well, Charles. Yes, okay, there, there, there are two things we have. First, uh, I'm not sure where the, the continue to go down will come from because I, I see I have no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, and it's, it's slightly unclear from Thomas's question whether he's referring to individual land plot prices if he's wishing to build a house on something or whether he is looking at a larger concept of buying land in order to do a development, large or small. Um, and this will depend uh, very much on location. Andrew, you just mentioned the uh, the Alentejo uh, area, um, whether there may still be some opportunities down there to 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 buy property at a or land plot at a uh, very reasonable price under a lot of environmental restrictions. But here in uh, high density areas of uh, Cascais, Sesteril, Lisbon, uh, downtown Porto, etc., cetera, um, prices are not going down. So I would say that now is a, uh, it's not going to get any better if you wait, is my answer. Yeah, this is all about scale and the delights of Portugal. Uh, its scale. We all appreciate Portugal for its scale and for, and for its intimacy. But if there is naturally, you know, a, a lack of supply, both of you know single plots in premium locations as well as certainly development plots. So I fully support you, Charles. Your response, uh, Mr. Maya, may uh, further engage with you. Um, yeah, welcome. After the after the seminar, seminar. we have a a, a uh, question submitted by Mr. Peter Graf. Um, thank you, Peter, for your for your question. But Peter's actually asking three questions and really requires a sort of personal consultancy period with, with Jeffrey. Um, Jeffrey, I'll, I'll leave you to answer one of the questions, then engage with yeah. the graph thereafter. Which I have thank now you. seen, Andrew. So uh, yeah. I think what I will address um, is a question regarding um, the income, how specifically his income will be treated. Again, it's something which we tend to look at and advise on on a case-by-case -case basis. But in relation to pension income, pension income currently um, under the new regulations uh, would be taxed at 10%. Um, in relation to investment income, now I know that there is a US angle here and we have many US clients um, who I suppose they, they carry their um, their taxability, if you like, within the US with them. Um, and certainly as regards um, capital gains tax on investments, rather than actually um, benefiting from an exemption, and it's not something which is exempt under the non-habitual uh, tax residency program, capital gains tax on investments, but you would get a tax credit um, for the tax which was paid um, in the US. So those are, I think, um, a sort of a, a reply to the two income tax questions. Um, the other two questions um, we'll be very happy to address directly with you. Just drop me a, a line by email. Um, I think you'll have all of the details um, available after the seminar. Um, if not, you'll be able to see on one of our sites, um, www.edge-il.com or www.nonhabitualresidence.com. So a couple of plugs there for um, our sites. So thanks very much for the question. And interestingly, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Graf are a Dutch USA couple close to retirement uh, from the UN. Indeed. Now, 
And now a question for Matthew. My goodness me, a long mm. question. A question from Alexandra de Priest. Um, Matthew, you've, you've got the question, you've read the question. Um, so I, I am going to read it out because the rest of our audience, of course, wants to, uh, wants to understand how you're going to respond. Here we go. What does Matthew advise regarding that most, if not all, major investment banks in the US, all of which I have my 401k private investment portfolio with stocks and bonds, etc., do not allow US citizens that live out of the US for more than six months to access their investments. They freeze, restrict, will not work with clients if living abroad for more than six months. In turn, many Euro investment banks have enacted the same policies. What is the advice for myself, a US citizen who plans on at some point retiring full time in Portugal? A very good, very comprehensive question. Do your best, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm afraid this is around US citizens living outside the USA. It's something called the Foreign Account Tax Compliant Act that was brought in a while ago in the US, um, which means a lot of institutions um, will not deal with US citizens. I'm afraid the answer to the question is that you would need to deal with a, a company that specializes in actually advising US nationals or those with assets in the US. At Blevin Strengths, we don't do that. Um, but I'm sure there are companies out there that can help, but sorry, I, I, I'm not able to answer that. Oh dear. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Alexandra. <laughs> there we are. Okay. That might be an opportunity, Matthew, for you to um, engage with such companies. Anyway, far be it from me. Um, back, back, to you. back to you, Charles. Um, this is a shorter question. From Mr. I, no, I don't know. Rasmus Ludzi Jr. Um, I don't know that's a Mr. or a Miss. And the question is: What are the eminent domain hurdles foreign investors face in Portugal? I'm not sure whether that's a, a Charles question or not, really. Well, I'll, I'll 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 give an answer, and anybody else is is welcome to put whatever they want on top. I'm I'm not 100% sure that I actually understand the the the, the question properly, but what we can say is there is uh, no restriction on the import or export of capital in and out of Portugal, so there are no hurdles as far as that's concerned. You will, when you're bringing capital into the country, um, there is a KYC, know your client process, that you will have to go through, which was um, uh, it's fairly thorough now, and I would say previously it was very light. You know? um, and uh, you will be, uh, you or the company you set up to do whatever you want to invest in here in Portugal will be subject to uh, taxes uh, here in Portugal. So if you sell the property and you make a healthy profit, you will be subject to capital gains tax here in Portugal. If you set up a corporate vehicle in order to invest in a building, renovating some properties here, then that will be subject to the normal um, corporation tax rules uh, applying to Portugal. And if you, if I am answering on behalf of uh, or to an investor, then those um, that type of conversation should be held with the likes of my colleague Jeffrey here, um, who is, uh, you know, has tax lawyers within his company, to see what would be the most tax efficient way, one, to bring in money and, and then to develop using that money within Portugal. Okay? But if Jeffrey wants to say some more on that. Oh, thanks, Charles. I think you've, you've covered it pretty well. I think that uh, you know, for this type of advice, it tends to be bespoke advice, um, and therefore it's down to the individual client, um, their circumstances, and what particular avenues they favour in terms of a tax structure, which they could use in order to minimise um, tax or indeed to create a tax efficient structure. Therefore, what we tend to do is, prior to giving such advice, is that we'll conduct a fact find on the client. Uh, we'll really look at what the objectives of the client are in terms of their investment, both in the short, the medium and the long term. Um, and any particular restrictions or characteristics, obviously, which they have. 
um, in terms of where their investment is is originating from. Um, so, we very. I think again, it's a sort of private consultancy type um, sort of question, uh, which is answered best through an individual. If you want to engage with me, please do, um, and we can see what solutions we can find for you. Good. Thank you, guys. A question for Matthew. He's almost falling asleep. Matthew, good afternoon from Satu Wieland. Um, mm -hmm. Satu says, I will be receiving rental income and a small pension in the UK. I understand that will be taxed in the UK. How do I avoid double taxation by Portugal? Okay. Um, well, to start with, Portugal and the UK have a double taxation agreement. It's been going for a long time. In fact, been going longer than the UK has actually. And Portugal has been a member of the EU. Um, what that means is you can't be taxed twice on the same income or gain. Okay, so that's a double taxation agreement. In terms of those types of rental income or, or, or pension, so if we start with a UK um, rental income, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming um, that that would be UK rental income, that is taxed first of all in the UK. Okay, so as, even as a Portuguese tax resident, you have to do a non-resident tax return and that is taxed in the UK, and that is what's called exempt uh, with progression in Portugal. There's no further tax in Portugal on that rental income. In terms of the small pension, uh, UK pension, it really depends on what type of pension, whether the UK tax it at source or not, or, or pay it without tax, which is gross. Um, but of course, under the new NHR regime, Portugal tax that at a flat rate of 10%. Thank you. Very good. Very concise, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, we have a question for Jeffrey, and probably um, with some input from, from Charles, from Tanvish Bat. Um, there's a proposal to promote investment in cities outside Lisbon and Porto for investments for golden visas. What impact would it have on the properties in Lisbon? Okay, I'll, I'll kick off, but then certainly Charles, uh, I'm certainly sure you have a view on this. Um, I mean, first of all, these proposed changes are still proposed changes. There's a framework as which has been given um, for actually changing um, the regulations to promote investment outside Lisbon, Porto, Porto and the, the coastal areas. Um, and indeed, but there's been an indication from government um, that they won't actually legislate until the beginning of next year. Um, however, there's also quite a lot of pressure coming from a variety of sectors. Um, to um, shelve these um, these changes or proposed changes um, simply because of the COVID-19 environment in which we are we are living. So that's very much to uh, contextualize um, and I do like the way the, pos the positive way the question is phrased um, Tanvish so um, but certainly I would think that um, in the, the we we're speculating a little bit and therefore um, you know, I feel to give an answer to that is a little difficult, but perhaps um, Charles, um, you could chip in with your views regarding perhaps um, any potential change that could have upon prices within Lisbon. Um, yeah, certainly, Geoffrey. The um, what we have to realise to start with is that the the Golden Visa Programme is attractive to um, reasonably wealthy people in um, uh, non-EU countries where they, they believe that their home country, which they love dearly, is economically, politically or religiously unstable. And what they're looking for is a plan B that hopefully they may never have to lose. Okay? Now, there are many countries in the world offering the equivalent of the golden visa that Portugal has. Cyprus, Lithuania, Germany, all sorts. So if you make it more difficult by forcing people to buy out in the sticks, then what will happen is that Portugal as a whole will suffer because those clients will go to an alternative destination altogether. Most of the people who purchase the Golden Visa for the motivations that I have just said, they fly into Lisbon, sometimes into Porto, but most of them fly into Lisbon. They, unfortunately, do not want 
to drive an hour, an hour and a half to where they have made their investment in the middle of the Alentejo. They want something that is near to where they land from whatever that foreign country is, and they want an income. And so the best income from rentals is going to come in the capital city. It's not going to come in the countryside because you simply will not be able to charge the type of rent that will give you a decent return on investment. So whilst I understand the government's position in trying to make sure that the Golden Visa program benefits all the geographic areas of Portugal, I think the realities are that hopefully the proposed changes will not be uh, brought into effect in the form that they currently are structured, because I think that would affect the whole country, not just Lisbon. But even so, the, the primary key motives, demand drivers, etc., that Andrew mentioned, uh, have, there are many ways of, of getting the golden visa. You can put a million euros into a bank account here for five years and leave it there. Um, you can buy something that needs renovation for 350,000 and then you have to renovate it. You want all that problem? Or much the most popular is to buy a property at over 500,000 euros and that will remain regardless of what the government do. And so I don't think it's going to have an effect on properties in Lisbon in any dramatic effect because also the Golden Visa is one of many attractions to Lisbon. Uh, it is not the unique reason why people buy property in Lisbon. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you very much, Charles. I, I'm juggling lots of things here, chaps, and listening to you mm. and trying to moderate as well as um, respond to our marketing ladies who are working on receiving more questions. Um, and, um, we have many, many more questions. And in the invitation to the webinar, um, the timing that was conveyed to the audience was from 5 until 6.30. Therefore, the audience assumes, therefore, that we will carry on until 6.30. And we're going to. No overtime, chaps. Um, so we will take as many questions as we can until about 6.25. And then I will have to conclude and, uh, and wrap up and say goodbye. Um, so, um, and we may or may not do the poll the micro poll. Uh, let's see. So, Jeffrey and Mas Matthew, a uh, question from Ronaldo Yamashita. I'd like to know how an offshore, offshore fund in the Cayman Islands will be taxed under NHR. Um, Mr. Yamashita has no problem in paying capital gains tax every time a redemption is made, but he's concerned with CFC laws and with paying taxes at every single portfolio rebalance. Whew. There we are, Matthew and or Jeffrey. If, I can't really have both of you taking the same question, so who feels most competent to respond in two minutes and then afterwards engage with Mr. Yamashita on a personal basis? Matthew, I don't know how algorithm friendly you are. Okay, I, I mean, so first of all, I think that. Um, um, first thing to emphasize is that uh, Portugal does have quite an extensive uh, list of blacklist um, jurisdictions which will suffer a punitive tax rate and in the case of capital gains tax, 35% um, as opposed to 28% and that's regardless of whether you are um, an NHR or not. Now um, the question there becomes, therefore becomes is, is are these going to be crystallized gains? And it's really only if we look at the minutiae of the product itself that we can establish whether, in fact, um, the Portuguese tax system would consider um, gains which are ruled up within such an investment um, to actually be crystallized gains, which would then be taxed to this aggravated rate. Um, generally speaking, um, as I say, it's on um, distributed uh, on, on, on gains which have actually crystallized. Um, the other principle which is generally applied, for example, to structures such as trusts. Trusts are often wrapped around um, investments such as these, um, is um, the principle of distribution. So therefore, only on a distribution um, from a trust 
um, to a beneficiary um, will that necessarily be taxed. But again, um, I think it's, um, it's something which is obviously a very specific product um, and where the CFC rules, uh, where we tend to see um, the CFC rules coming into play um, is more in relation to um, structures which have been, um, have been set up and are, are um, I suppose, they're making distributions to NHRs, um, specifically to NHRs. And an analysis of whether those um, companies, um, uh, in many of the cases, are actually do actually have a permanent establishment in the country in which they have their registered office. Um, those CFC rules did actually suffer some changes last year, um, and I'm not going to go into those because it's again pretty highly specialised. So I think um, ultimately, if you want a definitive answer, I think to your question. Um, Ronaldo, I think that uh, you'll need to engage with, with either myself or Matthew um, so that we can maybe understand a little bit about uh, fully your product and the product that you have um, and therefore the way in which it will be taxed specifically under um, the Portuguese uh, rules of, um, of income tax. So Matthew, I, I don't know whether you have a view on that. Um, I, Matthew, I'm going to have to cut in. I'm sorry, because it's just, it's just not fair. That we, I've got to try to balance obviously all these questions which we've got. We've got another 10 questions. Um, therefore, I need to move on and uh, let Charles answer a property related question. Good question from Matthew Lane. Um, he, Matt, Matthew is from Property Investor Today. So, Char, uh, Matthew asks if air bridges cannot be agreed between Portugal and the UK, will Portugal's second homes market suffer as a result? How can British buyers seeking an overseas homes in Portugal manage this without visiting the country in person? Okay, there, there are I have two things to say on that. Uh, one is that uh, somebody from the UK can freely fly into Portugal now without restriction. Andrew has actually just done so yesterday. The problem is on your return where currently there is this 14-day quarantine period, but I believe that that is being negotiated and we'll have to see what results from that. Secondly, I really am not highly qualified to answer this particular question, because if there was a problem, that problem, 90% of it is going to be in the Algarve, because that is where 90% of the British buyers are. Our market is a much more diverse market in terms of nationalities than the Algarve. And my colleagues in Fine and Country in the Algarve, I'm sure that they would say that that would re represent a problem. But during the actual webinar, I actually got a text message from um, the CEO down there saying, if you have the chance, please tell on the webinar that our inquiries in the Algarve for the period of May were up 30 percent on may 2019 so there's a positive in there. but yes i'm sure for lots lots of reasons um this air bridge needs to be established in a, in a, a fair and just way as quickly as possible uh, not only for the benefit of real estate agents but for the benefit of flight companies and people wanting holidays etc so it's not going to have a significant effect if it stays in force on my market in my area. But if you wish to speak to um, the executives of Finance Country in the Algarve, I'd be more than happy to put you in contact. Very good. Thank you, Charles. Um, Jonathan Landsberg asks Charles, does this mean that presently visits to property for sale are not permitted at all? Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, what it means is that uh, during the state of emergency, uh, we were only able to visit properties that were either empty or under construction. Uh, we were not able to visit properties that were um, uh, inhabited and therefore maybe the owners were there when you wanted to go with the potential clients. That is no longer the case, but it is uh, very much a, a conversation with both the potential client and with the owner of the property that is for sale, uh, that they must both agree 
that they wish to visit the property or in terms of the owner they wish to have their property visited and we will respect their wishes in that respect uh, whichever way it is but there are no no longer any restrictions in that respect it is all about personal preference very good good question and thank you for a very concise response charles matthew a good one here from mr rubin michael rubin um, we are americans moving to portugal soon we applied for the residency visa in january and we're just advised by the PT consulate that it was approved. What regime applies to us as we've been delayed in receiving the visa and arriving to Portugal before April the 1st? 0% or 10% tax on pension and 401k income. How does the bilateral regarding no dual taxation work? My wife will certainly get her social security taxed in the US. Thanks for answering. Um. Andrew, you're not going to like my answer. But once again, this is a US tax question, US national question. Which, um, would I be able to answer another question, maybe from either David Roberts or Gillian Lansberg? Because I, I, Any I, comments I, from, from, from Jeffrey? I, I do have a, a, a comment, uh, which is I think you have to establish your residency, uh, as in your right to reside in Portugal, um, which you've now obtained from your tax residency, um, two separate things. So therefore the fact that you have a residency or, or right to reside in Portugal um, through a residency permit does not automatically make you tax resident. And therefore I would say on the basis that this would be treated as pension income. And as I say, under the new rules, um, they did, um, the Portuguese government have opened up the 10% category to more than just uh, what I would call pure pension. Um, then it would be the new rules which would apply because it's only now that you can actually make the application um, for uh, in order to be a tax resident in Portugal. Good. Um, I would never teach you chaps to to, to, um, to your, your own business, but is it worthwhile having sort of cors correspondency firms in the US that you could refer some of these inquiries to? There seems to be quite a lot of, of very similar inquiries. I shall leave that thought with you. Don't, you don't need to respond today. I'm sure it's we, have a whole, we have a whole network, Andrew, that we work with. So therefore, what often happens actually is uh, when we are actually, um, clients come to us from a variety of different countries, is that we engage with their tax advisors within those countries to, make in, to ensure that they have a smooth exit from their country of origin and a smooth entrance into Portugal. Where they don't have those tax advisors in place, generally speaking, we have a network um, to which we can refer. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Um, a very interesting question from George Tseng, um, targeted with a comments at Jeffrey, um, mm -hmm. others may choose to, to contribute to respond. Perhaps this is a bit of a sensitive question, says George. It's certainly current. What is the level of racial, racial tension in Portugal? Is there a growing animosity against foreigners coming with Golden Visa program? What is the level of tolerance towards blacks, Asians, and other visible minorities? Thank you. Okay. I'm going to answer this with a case scenario, um, which is a um, client um, of ours. Um, actually had, was benefiting under the, um, the Beckham Law um, in Spain. Um, very favorable um, rate of tax um, that he was paying, if any. Um, but one of um, his complaints, he was um, Sri Lankan um, by birth. And one of the comments that he made is that he didn't feel as if, and he was living in obviously a very beautiful part of Spain um, as a high net worth individual, um, and that he didn't feel that 100% comfortable um, with, uh, with his family within Spain. He moved um, to Portugal um, and uh, he under the non residency program and the feedback which he constantly um, gave me during the time that he was here, that he did not experience any type of um, racial tensions um, as um, an NHR in Portugal. Now, okay, he was not a golden visa, 
But certainly, I think that across the board, uh, Portugal is her heralded as a tolerant country, um, a country in which um, really all creeds, nationalities, religions, uh, races, um, are, are, you know, are very much tolerated and, and without any degree of, of, um, of racism, racism. So um, that's just a direct feedback case scenario, which I can say to you, George. Matthew? Do you want me to say something on that? As well, Charles, yeah. Matthew first, if you would, kindly. Okay, Matthew? I'd like to add that Portugal was voted last year with the Global Peace Index uh, in 2019 as the third safest country in the world to live in, which is quite an accolade. Um, someone who, who's lived here a long time, I can say that I brought my daughter up here. Um, it's an extremely safe place, um, very racially to tolerant, but really reflected in that award as the thir third safest country in the world to live in um, says a lot. Okay, and, and I would just like to say that um, Portugal has experienced lots of inward immigration from all over the world well prior to the Golden Visa scheme. Uh, Portugal had colonies in, in India, various parts of Africa, South America. So it's used to being a multicultural society. It's a very, as Jeffrey said, it's a very tolerant society. Uh, I can't think of anybody commenting to me on religious or color prejudice related either to the Golden Visa or, or other forms of immigration. Maybe some has taken place, I really don't know, but it's never been an issue that has hit newspapers here or TV. So uh, hopefully between the four of us, we can give you a very positive reply on that. And I would endorse those, those uh, responses as well, all my 30 years in Portugal. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, safe, secure, very pleasant place to, to live, to, to bring up children. Um, I rose, raised my own children in Portugal and um, I would fully endorse Portugal. It's now 6.22 um, and I'm going to try to select one more question. Um, not easy to do that. And we have so many. Um, da, 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 da. Charles, Ooh. comporta, the comporta phenomenon. Please could you comment, this is a, a, a question from Louise Boucher, B-U-C-H-E-I-T. Could you please comment on the growth in real estate investment in the comporta area? You have three minutes, sir. Okay. Um, well, for those of you who don't know the comporta area, at the beginning of this webinar, I'm uh, I mentioned that it is an area, stunningly, stunningly beautiful area, south of Lisbon, on the coast, with uh, beaches as far as the eye can see in each direction. Absolutely glorious. Very little uh, touristic development there up until a few years ago, which has meant that the government and the local authorities have been able to avoid, in general terms, making the same type of planning errors that would have been made in the Algarve, etc. So they've learned a big lesson. Plus, the world has become much more environmentally conscious. So what you are allowed to do or not do in Comporta is very, very severely restricted in terms of environmental regulations, areas that you can build you can't touch the dunes they are all protected so <clears throat> for those people looking for space echo resorts tranquility total peace of mind beautiful beaches this was an undiscovered area of portugal and was actually promoted as such mainly in france uh, about five years ago. It would be unfair to say that it is still undiscovered, but it is promoted as sort of Portugal's hidden secret, um, which it very much was. It's proved extremely popular with uh, French and Belgian investors. There are now uh, some resorts being developed there by international funds, you know, which will see uh, quite a lot of growth down there. Um, 
Comporter itself is, is but one area. You, you would, the whole area encompasses uh, another area called Grandola, et cetera. Um, so you're into an area where you have large farms that can be divided up. Um, you will not find any of the developments that you might traditionally associate with the Algarve in the Comporter area. Plus also, none of the developments other than one on a peninsula called Troia uh, are actually on the sea because the dunes mean that you can't see the sea. So they're always behind the dunes. And it's pr produced, it, it, it's very popular. It's a very specific market. If you like to be in central Lisbon, you will not want to buy in Comporter. It's just a different thing. But at the end of the day, it has been a big success. Um, not widely known in the British market, I must say. But One minute. Very, very seconds. well in, in, the, in, the, in the French and Belgian market. Yeah? Um, okay, I'll leave you a few seconds, Andy. Thank you. I, I, I regret that we do have to begin to conclude because if not, uh, we'll be cut off by our meeting technology, which wouldn't be a very nice way to end. With, uh, the, this uh, this event, um, uh, and I don't want to listen to myself talking. So, just by way of really con concluding the, this, the webinar, providing you with a current uh, sort of Portugal C19 update, I would comment as follows: the key assets of Portugal and the Portuguese have not been impacted by C19. In fact, I believe they are more relevant and valuable than before. Portugal is certainly reconnecting markets. I flew into Lisbon yesterday from 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 um, from from London and took the train to my Algarve office. Um, there was no checks, um, and I was free to travel, albeit with my mask, um, down to down to the Algarve. There are more than 12 European airlines already flying into Faro, for example, and in July EasyJet and Ryanair scheduling much more capacity. Um, last but not least, um, although the reopening of Portugal is gathering pace. Portuguese government is living up to its Forbes ranking for Portugal as one of the safest global destinations, as Matthew mentioned. And there is a comprehensive reopening plan for the country for this month. A summary of this will be provided in our follow-up webinar communication. And now, sadly, we must end the webinar. There were questions which uh, audience, the audience provided to us, and those will be um, communicated to our three speakers and they will be in contact with you. Um, we may ask you by, by separate communication to complete a micro poll because there hasn't been time to do it today. C'est la vie. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed today's event and now believe that Portugal is a safe haven in the post C19 era and that you will consider moving to and or investing in this wonderful country. Last but by no means least, our thanks to you, the audience, for attending today, and to the speakers, Matthew, Jeffrey, and Charles, and of course, to the ladies behind the scenes, Dion, Raquel, and Sandra. So thank you from me, and goodbye from me, and, 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 uh, and gentlemen, thanks and goodbye from you in the last, in the last seconds. Jeffrey? Well, thank you. Goodbye, everyone. And thank you for your patience. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Matthew. Well, thank you, everyone, and um, look forward to receiving some questions we can answer by email. Super. And the veteran. Uh, ditto here. Thank you to everybody who dialed in, and I hope that this has been of some use to you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. And Very a, good. Thank to, a thank you to Andrew from all three of us yep. for his moderation. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. You. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. It's 6.29. I'm sure there are seconds to go before we are disconnected <laughs> by technology. And uh, thank you, everybody. And a safe journey home if you're traveling this evening. Um, very good. Thank you. Dion or Sandra or Raquel, you may disconnect us. Bye-bye. We haven't practiced this, have we?